views and opinions expressed in this program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. You might recall that last week as COVID-19, the coronavirus, began to spread, we interviewed a Bronx medical director and Fordham health professor about the epidemic to provide some preparedness information and perspective on the scope of the issue. Well, in just one week's time, the epidemic has turned into a pandemic and has taken on epic proportions with the suspending of NBA and NHL games, the closing of baseball spring training and delay of the start of the season, the closing of Broadway, the banning of gatherings of more than 500 people, and significant doses of fear and panic across not only New York, but the entire nation. During a lengthy press conference, Mayor de Blasio said he expected the 95 positive coronavirus cases in the city to be as high as 1,000, 10 times more, in just one week. There is much to say. We're going to review all of that. And if there's time, we'll talk about a range of other issues, too, with the state senator from the Bronx's 32nd Senatorial District. Welcome back, Senator Louis Sepulveda. Nice to have you. Thank you. Always good to be here. Challenging times for all of us, in, in not only New York and the Bronx and in America. Yeah. Um, what's your perspective on how, I guess, how well we're doing in coping with this very difficult situation? Well, I, th I think at, at the state level, I think the governor has led. Uh, the way a governor should lead. At the city level, I think the mayor uh, has done a great job. Uh, yesterday, he did a great job. Um, I think the response at the federal level has been abysmal. Uh, I think the president uh, allowed his vanity um, to essentially control the narrative and control the process of pre preparation uh, for the federal government. As a result, uh, we don't have sufficient testing. Uh, we don't have the medical infrastructure that if this spreads the way some people are predicting, uh, you're going to see uh, a lot of, uh, of bad scenes, so to speak, at emergency rooms, at hospitals. You're not going to have sufficient beds. Uh, this is something that potentially could be a real, real serious problem. And if it gets to that event, we have nowhere else uh, to point a finger at but the federal government and President Trump. Uh, let's talk first about, um, you mentioned uh, the mayor and governor. Historically, over the last, uh, you know, half a dozen years, they have not gotten along. They have not liked each other. They have attacked each other. I had the sense from watching uh, the mayor's press conference that all of that was off the table, and they had both uh, uh, put that aside because they recognized their responsibility to their constituents, to the city of New York and the state of New York. And frankly, as a New Yorker, I, w I was impressed. I I'm assuming well, you agree I, with that? No, as a legislator, I mean, as a legislator, I feel the same way. Um, not only that, but the Speaker and, and the Leader of the Senate. Um, we're doing what we're supposed to do, is put part, uh, partisanship aside and make sure that we protect the citizens of the state. And, um, and, and I think that, by and large, all the efforts are being coordinated and they're doing a good job. Is there a dialogue in the Senate right now about what you might do because we haven't heard any news, and, and it, it's certainly appropriate. Do you want to let the, the governor speak for the state and mm -hmm. all that? Or is it really in the governor's hands to administrate uh, various programs? Well, I mean, the governor has the biggest power um, and the biggest ability to, to combat it. Uh, last week, we passed a bill that essentially increased uh, the, power, the governor's ability to handle these, uh, this type of emergency. Uh, some people thought that uh, it was too expansive and giving too much power to the governor. But the truth is that we can take that power away relatively quickly if we believe he's overreaching. But So we've done that. Uh, we have spoken. The leader has certainly been in contact with the governor on a constant basis. And, you know, we as legislators, myself as a senator who has about 15 to 16 staff members, um, I'm very careful about exposing them. Uh, um, and I'm sure that other legislators are doing the same thing. 
Uh, what are your constituents saying? I mean, I mentioned the fear and panic, and I've, I've actually heard it both ways. I've heard people who said, you know what, it's all too much, why are we going through all this? And then I've heard other people who say, you know what, close the schools. I don't want my child, and I don't want parents, and I don't want, if they're a teacher, I don't want to have to be exposed to these situations, so why don't we close the schools? You know, is there a balance, or, or, and what are your constituents saying? Well, my, I, I think uh, you're getting the same thing. Some people say, <laughs> okay. we're, in fact, uh, on my way here with uh, a member of my staff, we were talking about individuals saying that, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fine, I can weather this, I'm in good health. Uh, the problem is that if you're infected, they may, you may infect someone who's not in such good health, someone senior who can die of, of the virus. Uh, in my office, you know, we get an average of about 30 to 50 constituents a day uh, visits, and that's essentially gone down to almost two or three a day. Um, and when I speak to people, especially parents and school children, they have the biggest uh, fear because their kids are uh, within a group of other children. Um, and they are in a position to be exposed relatively quickly. Um, but I think most people now are, are being careful. Uh, most people now are demonstrating the concern. Um, and I think now that the government has essentially taken charge of the process. Local government. Local government, yes, absolutely. Um, that people are, are heeding the advice and warnings that they're, they're being given. Uh, did you agree with uh, the mayor's assessment that it was a good idea to close, uh, to keep the public schools open? Uh, homelessness is an issue. What are you going to do with the kids? Uh, of course, and then it creates a, a domino effect because if a child stays home, then some of the parents who have to work, maybe they work on the MTA or other, you know, they could be um, a police or firefighters or whatever. Um, so did you agree with the, that idea to keep the schools open despite what you said may be a potential risk? You know, it's a very difficult decision to make for the mayor uh, because essentially it does disrupt an entire household. The parents don't work. Uh, but we do have to look at what the numbers are telling us. Uh, I'm sure that the, the mayor's health uh, professionals, uh, people that are advising him, have told him that uh, we're not ready yet for a full closure of the schools. Um, we have to some degree, if we have a 1,000 cases by next week, the way uh, the mayor's predicting, then maybe I think we should consider closing the schools. Uh, but as of right now, um, I think that we can still weather the storm a little bit. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a personal story. I've told uh, many of my friends this. I posted it on my Facebook page. I probably was at the last public event at Madison Square Garden because I was at um, a concert, uh, what was it, uh, last Tuesday. Mm -hmm. And um, <laughs> so I took the subway down to the, to the garden. I was very aware of what I touched. In other words, at one moment I held a pole and I was like, oh, goodness. Yeah. And then as soon as I got to the event, I washed my hands thoroughly before I even got, you know, as soon as I got in the door, I washed my hands. I made sure that while I was on the train not to touch my face, not to go near really too close to people or breathe on or those kinds of things. Then I sat at the concert. There were people next to me. I was aware of, you know, the, the space between us. Maybe during an intermission or during a long jam, I ran to the men's room and washed my hands again. And then when I got home, rode the train back, same kind of thing, mm -hmm. washed my hands and face. I felt I had done all I could do and that I didn't need to inhibit my activities further. Um, what's, your, what's your feeling on that, that now somebody who wants to go to a Nick game is not going to be able to do that? If they had followed that protocol, you know, what's wrong with that? Or, or did we still need to do more than what I very, I think, very responsibly did. Well, I mean, we're doing now what our parents told us when we were children and what we tell our children that we're parents, that wash your hands and don't, you know, sneeze on people. And uh, uh, Look, we, we, we didn't expect this. Uh, we didn't expect, uh, again, the federal government didn't really prepare us for what was coming. Uh, but right now we have to do what we're facing. Um, Self-isolation is essentially something that we should all consider, especially those that aren't feeling well. The objective now is to stop the spread of the virus. And in order to do that, we have to take measures so we don't wind up like Italy that has over 60 million people who are basically quarantined, for lack of a better term. Uh, but we have to be this, uh, this careful. We have to wash. We have to do everything that you did uh, on that I trip. I did the right thing, you right? You did exactly the right thing, <laughs> and everyone right. should be doing that because that will also help us contain the spreading of the virus. Uh, let's talk about the economy. There was a story in the a newspaper about how the MTA is going to suffer because, uh, frankly, when I took the train the other night, it was like 5.30, and it was like rush hours, expecting a lot of people, yeah. and the trains were relatively empty. Um, uh, uh, how concerned are we, I guess, number one, 
um, specifically about the MTA and, and its, its struggling budgets anyway. And then, of course, in the general about Wall Street and, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, it's very easy to say we're going to end the NHL season or close down Madison Square Garden. But the, the trickle down of, of the economy of that is extraordinary with the numbers of workers who won't get paid and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Well, I mean, look, the, I, I'm not as 100 percent convinced on the MTA's budget issues because they refuse to open up the books. And until we see those books, we can't really uh, assess where they are. Um, however... Obviously, if you look at the stock market, we had the 2,000-point uh, drop, one of the biggest drops since 1987. Uh, you're looking at businesses that are going to close, uh, people that are suffering. Um, and again, not to harp on this, but again, I put the blame on this on the federal government and on the president's actions. Um, if we had prepared better for it, uh, maybe we could have provided more funding. Uh, maybe we could have taken other measures to make sure that our business community doesn't suffer the way it's going to suffer. It's, you're already seeing the numbers. Um, the stock market is on an incredible ride. Um, you know, it's dropping 10, 12 percent, um, biggest drop since 87 again. And I think we're going to continue to see those massive downward fluctuations uh, in the next few, few what, weeks. What ultimate, you know, as we watch the Wall Street uh, drop and we watch all these other things, there will be people who are hurt, um, significantly sure. hurt. They don't yeah. have jobs. I mean, Yankee Stadium workers who, you know, even two weeks. But, they, but it goes down. Yeah, the worker, but the people who don't go to the stadium are no longer buying products nearby. They're not going to the local stores. They're not... They're not taking a taxi. They're not taking the Uber. All it has such an impact in well, so many and, ways. And so is there ultimately a plan or a solution for those kinds of things, a, a stimulus package or something, or do you step back for the moment and say, let's see what happens and then evaluate that? Well, I mean, obviously there's going to be a combination of two. There's going to be piecemeal solutions, obviously attempts at piecemeal solutions. Uh, we have to look at the big picture. Um, and right now you're going to have to see a, a massive amount of uh, – bailout, so to speak. Um, but I hope it's not just to the banks or the big corporations. I hope it takes care of the mom and pops that are really going to suffer because volume is critical to, to their businesses. Um, so let's, let's not go and do what we've done in the past, which is bail out the big banks, the big corporations, and forgotten about the little individuals that are hurt by the actions of this president. I uh, thought what the governor did uh, in terms of um, manufacturing uh, uh, hand sanitizer mm -hmm. Uh, was a very interesting move. How did you? And, and he got a lot of uh, kickback because uh, people were upset about uh, low wages for um, incarcerated people. Mm -hmm. How did you feel about that whole effort? And uh, you know the, the, that that kind of downside of well, you're using people who are not really being paid appropriately. You know, it's it's. I think that that narrative was a little bit confusing. I have a different perspective as a chair of the Corrections Committee for the New York State Senate and a person who visits facilities quite often and speaks to people that are incarcerated quite often. Um, a lot of people don't realize that the product, the company that, that, that the governor is using um, is called Corecraft. Corecraft produces our desks at schools. They produce the soaps that we use at schools. Uh, they produce uh, tables, uh, products that are used every single day by our school systems, our hospitals, different um, uh, state and city, mostly state uh, enterprises, agencies, entities. Uh, they already do the work for Corecraft. Uh, additionally, uh, uh, Corecraft, although I have uh, legislation to increase the salaries of people that are incarcerated, Corecraft pays a higher salary than most other uh, entities that use uh, incarcerated labor, people that are incarcerated uh, mm -hmm. to do products. Um, and in my conversations with individuals uh, that are incarcerated, they tell me, look, we, we prefer, that's, that's the place where everybody wants to work because they learn skills. And as, as recently as a couple of days ago, I spoke with some of the individuals to make sure that they're taking steps within uh, our facilities, uh, pr uh, prison facilities, not to spread it. They've told me, look, we want to be part of the solution. We want to feel helpful. So it sounds like you thought this was a good move. Certainly um, the governor was trying to think of here's a, a, an item that the general public needs. I'm going to do my best to Look, get it no, out. No so solution moment, is perfect, uh, right. uh, Gary. Um, and of course I have issues with the, with the labor, uh, the cost of labor, uh, the salaries of people that are incarcerated. Um, but uh, we have to remember that, that individuals that are incarcerated are getting housed, home, food, and so forth. Um, they shouldn't get the labors that they get. It should be higher. But on a crisis like this, and they themselves have told me, we want to be part of the solution. We want to feel like we're helping our state. Mm -hmm. I mean, I spoke to about six or seven 
individuals that are incarcerated have told me, uh, you know, again, we don't like the, the cost, the, the, the labor, um, the, pay. the pay that we get. Yeah. However, um, Core Crafts is one of the better companies, and we want to help. And, and, you know, in a way, that's, that's a good thing for somebody who's mm -hmm. in prison because they get to feel part of society. Yes. Maybe it's their way of giving back. Exactly. Um, yeah. Among the things which I indicated during my trip on the subway and, and the trip to Madison Square Garden is a change of behavior. And one of the things that uh, obviously we need to do, certainly until this is solved to whatever degree we can, um, people need to change their behaviors in this way. I want to just pick up another issue which came out of the state, and that's the notion of the plastic bag ban. Um, I heard a lot of kickback for it. I was in the grocery store. You know, I was trying to, living life, you, you learn something. I was in the grocery store the other day. Just about everybody in front of me online had a, a, a bag with them. The uh, uh, grocery store had a stack of paper bags mm -hmm. that they were giving out. Maybe a little bit difficult to change behaviors. I feel like we, st at least from my little moment that I saw in a Bronx grocery, I thought, uh, I think we're, we're doing okay. People are able to change if they're kind of urged to do so. Is that your well, thought? I mean, whenever we pass legislation or do policy that, that can alter behavior, uh, generally speaking, if it's something that's going to work, people will complain at the beginning. <laughs> and I've gotten complaints, but it will change behavior. And, and I think a lot of times we live in the today and the now, and we don't look at future generations. We don't look at what we're doing. And if we create, continue to create these plastic bags, the impact it will have on our children and our children, our grandchildren, and so forth. And so we have to see, um, take these steps that will change behavior. Look, you, you, have you heard any other than the president's tactics on, on trying to... to um, to kill uh, the green light bill. All the screaming and raving and ranting and raving about. And literally threatening the state of New York right. over it. I was going to bring that up. And yeah. nothing but good things have happened about it. And in fact, I have colleagues. Explain what, what you mean by that. Well, um, I think over 75,000 applicants. Uh, one of the complaints or one of the fear mongering components of the Republican Party was that it was going to lead to people trying to uh, vote illegally in this state or uh, people uh, actually registered to vote. Right. or uh, a, back, a backdoor way to immigration, there hasn't been a single case of anybody attempting to, to illegally register to vote uh, that, are, that are part of uh, an applicant of a green light. Through, through this process. Exactly. In fact, I've had colleagues, including Republican colleagues, who opposed uh, the legislation, who have met with me talking about how we can make it easier for a certain segment of their population, like the El Salvadorian population, to having difficulty because of the way their licenses are written and approached me about how we can help them with the consulate. And I, you know, one of the first things I said to them is kind of an irony that you <laughs> oppose it and are asking for me to help you. Well, because it's helping their constituents. Of course. People, people go into the commercial centers now. They're able to drive and spend money. This uh, is a nice segue toward uh, the bail reform a bill, which has been soundly <laughs> attacked. And uh, there are suggestions now that, um, it's, it, you know, maybe there should be some reform of the reform and, and put some discretion in judges' hands to evaluate uh, whether or not uh, somebody should uh, be, uh, you know, remanded to mm -hmm. prison instead of, uh, you know, being let go free. And we certainly have seen all the high-profile cases of uh, somebody who, uh, you know, um, <laughs> could have been incarcerated, then goes out and commits another crime or disappears. Um, are you ready now to say, let's adjust uh, the bill because it's not quite what we well, were hoping? first, let's be clear. I have read about all these supposed sensationalism of arrests and people that were released uh, that turned out to be complete fear-mongering and nonsense and misinformation. You, really? You think they're Oh, absolutely. For example, the Nassau County uh, Police Commissioner, when railing and screaming and yelling about how the bail reform bill was the reason why an individual was going to testify against an MS-13 uh, um, defendant, the, the witness ultimately it was murdered, and he blamed bail reform. But when they explained to him the process of the litigation, he ultimately accepted that it wasn't, had nothing to do with bail reform. Mm -hmm. However, he put a one-sentence statement out saying, oh, it wasn't uh, due to bail reform. The individual has been arrested uh, like 100 times on the subway, right? They say he keeps, well, he was arrested 97 times before bail reform. Um, so that, that hasn't really changed anything. Uh, and I can by, tell you, by the way, I mm -hmm. never understood that. Yeah. There should be a limit to the number of times if somebody's arrested for the same thing. I mean, 97 is ridiculous, but even 10 times, it seems to me the penalty should then change, even if it's a, a you know, a, a yeah, jumping, I mean that, jumping that, a fair beating or something. Well, like that. that's an area that, that 
that we have looked into, uh, people that are constantly arrested. But the reality is that this individual was arrested before bail reform, and there was no, you know, outrage about that at that time. And again, there's so many different cases that are put out there that we ultimately debunk. The commissioner the other day put out uh, statistics saying that that uh, bail reform led to the spike in crime. I think he's, look, he's looking for an excuse. The reality is, and I've spoken to the DAs in the city, that they all told me that crime was going up as early as July of 2019, mm -hmm. and that there's no possible way that the commissioner can correlate what has happened with bail reform. In the last couple of months. In the last couple of months. Absolutely not. So, yeah. and, and in fact, when he was questioned about it in an intellectual way, he struggled to attempt to justify what he was saying, because it's, it's just fear-mongering. Just to conclude, um, you know, the, the bottom line answer to my question, mm -hmm. so you think at this point it's too soon to look at reform, even though it's going to be it being debated and, and uh, going to come up in the legislature? Look, something this large, something this transformative, uh, you always have to look at. You always have to look at the impact. Legislation of this nature, you know, you can always improve anything. There's, you know, there's, there's very few pieces of legislation of this magnitude that have been passed throughout the state or the federal government that you can say is perfect. Uh, what we have to do is look at how we could make it better. You talk about judicial discretion, uh, and, and, and the problem that we have with that is that, first of all, people don't realize what bail is. Mm -hmm. Bail was never meant to be hold people in, in prison until you have a hearing. It's meant to make sure people come back to the prece uh, to proceedings, to the criminal proceedings throughout their trial. And, and the reality is that most people didn't know that. You know, people thought it was, you know, they, they're accused of committing a crime, now we hold them in. That's not what bail is and never will be. It's to get them to come back. It's to get them to come back. And the reality also is that it rich people, remember Harvey Weinstein, you could pay a million dollars bill, he was out in the street the next day, he was looking for talent over the Christmas holidays. Yet a poor person who can't afford $500 bail is stuck at Rikers Island. How does that make us safer? It does not. Nothing is 100% pure. We're going to look at it. If there's something that we have to change, we will change. But the reality is that the current system was discriminatory to black and brown and poor people, and we cannot allow that. And that's why you needed the changes. Uh, let's uh, uh, talk about uh, uh, some political issues. You've already expressed pretty clearly how you feel about uh, the current president and uh, the federal mm -hmm. government. You were, as I recall, a Bernie Sanders supporter in 2016. It appears that he is not going to be getting the nomination this time around. Um, just in general, your thoughts about Bernie's campaign, uh, the the prospect of having Joe Biden be the, the ticket bearer for the Democrats this year? What do well, you I've, I've always said that I will, I will vote for whoever the party's nominee is. Um, the, the, the big objective is to get rid of, of Trump, who is probably the most corrupt president we've had in modern history. Um, so to me, that's important, right, to win, to get rid of Trump. Uh, Bernie Sanders has a huge following amongst the young young voters in this country. They are the future of this country, and he has motivated them to get politically involved. Uh, clearly, when you look at the numbers, it'll be more difficult, yet it's not over. Uh, neither one of them, I think, has even 50 percent of, of the delegates that are necessary. Um, and I still think that keeping uh, Bernie uh, uh, at debates uh, as a candidate will help the Democratic Party. Competition it, it, is good for always bringing good. out the vote Look, regardless this, of how it turns uh, at out. At this point last year, Trump was about 4 to 6 percent like uh, in 2016, I should say, Trump was about 4 to 6 percent likelihood of winning the election. Now, I know he's the incumbent now. It's a different animal. But I don't think, you know, some people say that Trump's going to win. They, it's a foregone conclusion. But I don't think that's the case. His base hasn't increased significantly, if, if at all. Uh, independent voters are not flocking to Trump. And if you look at some of the turnouts in some of the uh, um, uh, caucuses and, and primaries, for example, in Nevada, you've seen an incredible increase in the number of people that have come out. Uh, and I think ultimately uh, a lot of, of how he's handling this situation with the coronavirus will also open the people's eyes about how incompetent it, this president is. It will also, uh, I think, the um, uh, at least for the moment, the collapse of Wall Street will make it difficult to say, hey, we have a, you know, we, we did well with the economy. No, no, what he's trying to do is blame Obama for now for coronavirus and everything, but he won't give Obama credit for the economy he was left with. That's, that's the odd thing. Uh, let's talk about uh, local politics. Oh, um, no. Uh, Marcos, <laughs> Marcos Crespo has stepped down, uh, said he's mm -hmm. stepping down as um, a chair of the Bronx County uh, Democratic Committee. And the Assembly. And the Assembly, yeah. and uh, Borough President uh, Diaz has made it clear that uh, his uh, 
political career is going to be over. I, I don't know. Do you have an interest in either of those uh, positions? Uh, you want to start there? Uh, my interest right now is getting reelected to the New York State Senate, um, working for the people that I represent in the Senate, and then we'll see what happens afterwards. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was a sh too short an answer. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and the other thing I want to talk about um, is the uh, 15th, the race for the 15th uh, Congressional District. Uh, yes. There are, uh, I, you know, I don't know, a dozen candidates. I mm. seem to lose track and people get <laughs> added and, and not added. And um, I ran into uh, uh, Council Member Reverend Diaz uh, the other day, and he felt like he was sitting pretty, that they're all going to cancel themselves out. Do you think it's time for uh, people on the Democratic side to coalesce a little bit and um, uh, say, you know what, let's uh, make sure that, frankly, a Trump Democrat doesn't... Uh, represent the Bronx, which would be remarkable considering that uh, this is quite a Democratic county. Yeah, I mean, I, obviously I have a particular issue with uh, Councilman Diaz being the, a congressperson because this is a, a progressive liberal county. Um, and, uh, you know, now you have Councilman... A, let's be fair, you have a long relationship with well, him. Well, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, he has done good work in the community. I mean, that, that's no denying that. And, he, and politically speaking, he has been helpful to me in the past. I won't deny that. Uh, but the reality is that something as important as a congressional representative in this district cannot be someone who is really a Trump Democrat. So will you, would you urge, I mean, I could list many of Melissa Mark Viverito, Richie Torres, Michael Blake, mm -hmm. uh, Julio Pabon. I mean, I'm going to forget somebody. And Samalis somebody's Lopez. Be, Samalis Lopez. <laughs> I mean, these are all, you know, yeah. well-qualified people. Would you recommend that they say, you know what, maybe you ought to coalesce around one person? Oh, I've, I've been requesting that for some time now. We have to make sure that we call this. The problem is that you have individuals that, you know, are working hard for this, uh, competent people, uh, strong-willed people, uh, egos get in the way. I, I, asked, <laughs> I, I will tell you, viewers may know, I asked uh, Richie Torres the same question, mm -hmm. uh, and he looked at me and smiled and said, well, that's not how politics works, yeah, exactly. does it? Yeah. Um, uh, so at this point, um, we really don't know um, how it's going to turn out. I mean, you think everybody will stay in till the till the bitter end? I guess. Oh, I think I think they will. I, I don't see anybody stepping off. I, I, you know, hopefully they will, but I don't see it happening. Uh, Senator Diaz, I want to thank you for joining us. Uh, no, as long I long name. Uh, Senator, <laughs> Senator Sepulveda, oh my goodness gracious. Thank you, for, okay. thank you for catching that. I've been, I've been doing this too long. And what I was. When well, you have him on the show, have you ever said, call him Councilman Sepulveda? Yeah, that's it. I will do that. He'll probably love that. Uh, but I, um, I, I thought that we would um, shake hands the, the oh, modern yes, that's way right, to that's thank right. each other. This is how we do it. As I've been saying to people, it's the same affection, just a different expression yes, of it. Yes. Uh, thank you very much for your time. We noted, by the way, I did the count. He's been on the program 21 times, right. even before he was elected an official <laughs> great guest and, and I appreciate the straight talk it's Thank always you. great folks if you have further questions or comments on anything you heard on tonight's show or anything going on in the borough of the Bronx then uh, make sure you send us uh, an email at uh, Bronx talk at uh, Bronx dot org or uh, you can uh, send us a message on Facebook or you can send us a tweet or whatever you'd like we thank our producer is Helen Greenberg, our director, Nick Marrero. Abelay over here has uh, done a great job also helping us set up. And uh, we'll see you next week. Good night.